Today, the alarm bells are ringing with Tarek Brooker. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And I'm joined Friday afternoon with journalist Tarek Brooker. Hi, Tarek. Hey, Martin, how are you? I'm all right. How are you going? Yeah, not too bad. There's a lot to keep up with these days. You, you know, and you look at some of these things coming out with what's going on with Evergrande in China and all this other stuff, and you just don't know what's going on. <laughs> Whatever way you look, there's a bit of confusion, um, a little bit of misdirection, and uh, a lot of, um, frankly, stupidity. <laughs> oh, well, there's plenty of that, unfortunately. But, you know, it's, it's just, it's so, it's so hard to know exactly how challenging things are at the moment. There's just, there's just so many different mixed messages going on and different narratives. You know, the Fed and the RBA continue to, to harp on about it being transitory. But then, you know, there's people say like Mohammed El Urian from, from Allianz who's saying, you know, I like the title of this video, that the alarm bells are ringing and that central banks need to step in to stomp on inflation now before it becomes a greater issue. Mm, well, it's interesting. If you look back to the um, 70s and 80s, right, the first seeds of inflation were actually quite benign and gentle. And everybody said then it's transitory, it's temporary, nothing to worry about, right? And all of a sudden, this huge steamroll of inflation came hewn and long, and basically nothing could stand it, right? And so we had this massively high inflation. And in retrospect, of course, you could see how all those early signs naturally led to the later. Now, I'm not saying it's necessarily the same now, but I think we should be cautious, right? Because it's happened like that before. We should be cautious. It should be... Uh, realistically, central banks should have a plan B, and so should and, and so should governments. They should have a, a plan in place of what are we going to do? How are we going to support our economies? How are we going to support jobs? How are we going to do all these different things if inflation does get out of control? And the truth is, is that, that, that there is no plan B. It's just literally just pumping more money into the system, pumping more QE and hoping for the best. And we're really starting to see in the US in particular, in say, for example, Joe Biden's approval rating and even the, even Congress's approval rating, that people are very unhappy with the way inflation's playing out. Now, I know that the US CPI came in very hot recently at 6.2%, its highest level in more than 30 years. But the ironic thing is, is that is actually underrepresenting true inflation. You know, actual rents are increasing at more than 15% per year and wholesale food prices are up by around about, uh, by over 8%, according to the US Department of Agriculture. So, you know, it's it's really quite challenging out there. And as we previously discussed a few months ago, the, the big issue is how consumers feel inflation and how that affects their spending in the end. Yeah, I think you've hit a really important point there, right? Because there's obviously the you know economic narrative, which is depending on how you read it, positive or negative, and you know central banks need to pump more, or central banks should dial up interest rates, right? But then there is the impact on consumers and businesses, and I th think that's where the real rubber hits the road. Because if consumers start to get twitchy, you know, higher interest rates. I mean, look at what's happened with uh, mortgage fixed mortgage rates in Australia. You know, the banks have been moving them up. You know, not just. 5, 10, 15 basis points, but 40, 50, 60, 80 basis points, right? And uh, whilst they've still got this little wind of opportunity to say, well, there's still very cheap flooding rates are going to go away very quick. So you can see how, psychologically speaking, businesses and consumers could start to catch a cold. And of course, if that happens, then it's a feedback loop, negative feedback loop. In a way, you could say the same about China. You know, the growth momentum is easing there. And, um, you know, you've got to even question the growth momentum in the US because the forward leading indicators from some of the central banks suggest that growth is falling away again. So, you know, all that billions and billions and trillions of dollars that's been thrown into the system for years and years and years, we've got, what, two and six months for it. That, well, that's, that's the big issue, isn't it? I mean, you know, we threw a World War II size deficit at the economy in the US here in Australia as well, despite the fact that our experience with the virus was nowhere near as bad as what, the, what theirs was. But what do we realistically have to show for it? Do we have, you know, heaps of new hospitals, new schools, new roads, you know, the, the, the things that we traditionally associate with, with government spending? No, we have a bunch of mostly wealthy people with loads of money in their bank accounts 
and a bunch of new home renovations and expensive used cars. And, and I mean, just, just also on the topic of, of China and inflation, I mean, their producer price index is up at its highest level in, what is it, 26 years, I believe? Yeah. You know, 13%, I believe it was at the last count. And I mean, if that starts feeding into their super CPI and they start exporting inflation and that becomes, you know, entrenched, it, it's, it's game over. That's it. You know, we're going to need to raise interest rates and keep raising them until we put, put, put a lid on inflation. Because if not, we're just going to have, it will be 1970s runaway inflation if that feeds in and, and stays there. Well, the other point I'd make, um, Tariq, if rates start to go up, then the whole MMT story falls apart, right? Because the cost of the debt will be so huge that they won't be able to actually spend it on other stuff because they'll be spending it on the interest on the debt. So it really changes the game completely. Well, it, the, the problem, I think, is that it's a complete paradigm shift from what, we're, what we've seen in the past you know, 15 or 20 years where inflation hasn't really been a significant problem in, mo in most of the the developed world and you know the, the question is is you know how do we address these things without blowing up our systems you know how do we i mean i don't know if it's just more qe to the moon you know if we're just going to keep buying you know if central banks are just going to buy more and more and more debt in order to you know offset the fact that the debt is going to have a higher cost of service it's just I mean, but that brings us brings us back to my initial point. There is no plan. It's just literally hoping for the best, and that's what makes the Fed's actions and the RBA's actions all the more concerning, in my view. I mean, to me, they should be raising they should be raising rates now. They should be at least, even if it's just 0.15 percent, 0.25 percent, something just to signal that this is possible. Put a lid on the excess a little bit. I mean, this is really what they should have been doing, you know, three or four months ago at least. But something just to say that eventually normal monetary policy will resume and that the emergency stuff will eventually shift. But they haven't done that. And instead, they've allowed the bubble to get bigger and bigger and bigger and to have even worse consequences when it inevitably bursts. Mm. And very interesting, of course, because uh, Jerome Powell's um, position is up for uh, renewal or not um, in a few months, right? And now there's a rumour that um, a more dovish alternative might be being considered by uh, the Biden administration, which would suggest that there's actually an intent from some people at least to do more of the pumping. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's two schools of thought when it comes to Brainard, who is the dovish, you know, the supposedly dovish alternative to Powell. And on one hand, you know, obviously, you know, she she is much more of a, I don't know, just a big, a big, a big QE, you know, type type spender. But by the same token, the thing is that from what I've read from some Fed, former Fed insiders is that she's not someone who the Senate will be able to confirm because, well, you know, they're not gonna get they're not gonna get Manchin's vote and people like that who are concerned about inflation and the Fed pump into the moon. So you know, I mean, that that then leads us to an interesting sort of question. If it's not Brainard or Powell, who is it going to be? And that creates some fairly significant uncertainty for markets, particularly given the jitters involving, well, it's not jitters, the seismic shifts underway within, within China and the fact that, you know, we are seeing much, much higher inflation than most people expected. Well, I think we should just solve it by putting... Um uh, Janet Yellen's across both, right? I mean, the because <laughs> the Treasury and the Fed are getting closer and closer together anyway. So why not just bang it all together? Oh, well, why don't we just make a God Emperor of America while we're at it? We may as well. You know, I mean, it's it's just everything's all just it's all just together at this point. You know, any any ideas that you know that the Treasury and the Fed and that the federal government, you know, were different and that they had, you know, these these different agendas and these these different competing. Um, policy goals it's just it's just gone it's just you know let's just pump the debt let's just throw more money at it you know it's okay it's not all this trillions of dollars isn't going to be inflationary and it's like what <laughs> what okay well, i get yeah. the wages inflation is different from real inflation come on oh it, honestly I, I look at the commentary going on at the moment you know oh inflation is good it's good for poor people it, you know it's a real problem for the one percent it's like oh my god seriously just just shut up <laughs> this is seriously like worse than worse than mary antoinette stuff and and not only that but they're just like oh but but biden's infrastructure package is going to solve supply chain issues straight away and it's like no it won't it's going to take time it's going to potentially take years 
some of these things are going to take decades. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, God. It's yeah. just so oh, it's new, ridiculous. New bridges, you know, take a little while to uh, plan and roll out and everything, right? And uh, even increased broadband connectivity. Well, it may help, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> lead to something directly, right? So, uh, again, it goes back to this point we made earlier on. There are so many conflicting narratives out there and everyone's sort of hanging their hat on something to try and actually explain why it's not going to go pear-shaped, right? But I have to say there are a lot of pears on the tree. <laughs> well, it, it, a lot of it is just, it's all, it's all just based on, on hope. You know, we have never been here before. And I think, you know, these ideas of extrapolating out what we've seen over the last, you know, say 6, 12, 18 months is just, it's just incredibly flawed. You know, we have no idea what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's all just literally up in the air. And I think pretending that things are going to be fine with any, and, and pretending with such a high degree of certainty, I think is really just, it's really something. I mean, like a few months ago, a few months ago, you know, you and I talked about the virus. We talked about the fact that, now I know that this is a controversial issue and I know people have very, very different views on this, but we're talking purely here about the policy response of governments and how Martin and I discussed that in the past. And we said, we need to be cautious about the return to lockdown and the potential impact on supply chains. And lo and behold, Europe, parts of Europe are talking about going back into lockdown. And that once again, just restarts the timer on, the, on, on solving the supply chain issues. And, you know, it just further entrenches the problems we already have. Yeah, yeah. Well, pretty much wherever you look, you can make quite a strong set of arguments for more trouble ahead. We ain't out of it yet. And don't even mention 1.5 degrees and all the other stuff that's over the horizon that uh, you know, the people in Glasgow are uh, sort of thinking about. But now you've got some slides, haven't you, which um, uh, people love. So why don't we switch across to, uh, to those, Tarek? Okay. Well, we've got our good friend Jerome Powell there providing the market with QE. So, you know, I think that's a good place to start. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Now, this is this is a good chart from Bloomberg that basically shows the level of port congestion at ports throughout the world. And it really illustrates well, I think, how these issues ripple around the world. I mean, uh, earlier in the year, there was the outbreaks of the outbreaks of, of, of the Delta strain in places like Yantian, which is one of the biggest port, well, I believe it's the second busiest port in the world, which is in China. And as a result, we ended up with a huge, huge backlog of, backlog of ships in along the along the, the Chinese coast. And obviously this this caused further supply chain delays for and further issues for, for manufacturers and just issues with sourcing goods in general. Now, ironically, that 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 spreads around the world, you know, because as it as it ripples through, you've got all these ships sailing from say, you know, Yanchan or Shanghai to Los Angeles or Long Beach or Rotterdam or any of these other major ports in around the world. And it just, as it ripples around, it just entrenches these delays. And only when you really start to see some major shift in terms of actually, you know, getting these, these backlogs resolved, will, will it actually be f more fully addressed? Mm, and that's worth reflecting, of course, ships have lots of containers on those ships. And so the containers are also completely out of position too. So when you actually add that, in front of the picture that you got there in terms of you know where the ships are and the congestion it shows you why the uh, supply chain issue is so complex indeed i mean at last count the other day there was 120 container ships waiting to be unloaded along the along the, the coast of of, of california <laughs> at the ports of long beach and los angeles and that each one of those ships i believe the s i think this is don't don't quote me on this but i believe the estimate was about 22,000 20 foot containers per per ship multiplied by 120 ships <laughs> so you're talking about you know literally millions and millions of containers you know multiple millions of containers in into an economy that only imports 26 million 20 foot equivalent containers per year so you've you you may quite literally have 10 percent of annual u.s imports containerized imports sitting off the coast of, of, of Long Beach and Los Angeles right now. And that just illustrates just how enormous the flow of, of these items is and how much of a shock it proves to the system when you literally have 
sort of 10, 10 or maybe even close to 12% of the total volume of trade coming in at a single time, which then needs to feed into the rest of the country through rail, road and other logistics. Yeah, and the point, of course, there is it's not only just uh, retail products and services going direct to the shops, but it's also materials and components for other things that are built in the US. So, again, it's got this sort of turn-on effect, right? So, basically, the more and more those raw materials and uh, components are actually trapped, uh, the bigger the impact more broadly. So, the idea that this is just transitory and everything's going to get fixed in a few months seems to me to be very... Um, myth- well, at best a myth and quite more like a fairy tale. Well, I- indeed, and that's something that that's a, a position that experts share. The port, the officials at the port of Rotterdam said that these delays and these issues are going to continue well through 2022. And you know that one of the senior executives at Maersk, which is one of the biggest uh, shipping lines in the world, recently said that he doesn't expect them to be resolved until at least 2023. Now, this could be people talking their book, but we haven't seen any real indication so far that the broader issues are going to be resolved. No, absolutely. Yep, troublesome. Now, this is this is a good illustration of, of the issues in terms of how it's spreading, not just in, through from the ports, but into the rest of the US. You're seeing that the, the, the truck, the cost of trucking freight has risen by over 15%. And the cost of warehouse construction has risen by more than 20% because simply put, there just aren't enough warehouses and there aren't enough truck drivers. As it stands, it was estimated, I believe yesterday, that there are there is a shortage of about 80,000 truck drivers. And that is expected to worsen potentially significantly once the trucking industry is impacted by uh, Joe Biden's vaccine mandate, particularly in states with low vaccination numbers. So... You know, it's it's really an open question as to when the, all these problems are actually going to be resolved. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is just uh, one example, but you magnify that around the world and you can see just how really complicated this whole jigsaw puzzle is. And, uh, you know, so many components are just not uh, arriving at the right time, in the right place, at the right um, speed. With, of course, um, again, I highlight the fact that even a pair of, for example, trainers, right, um, has 50 to 80 components from all around the world put together to make trainers. (laughs) We've built ourselves a huge global machine to make stuff, and the global machine is misfiring. Exactly, it is. And, and And that's part of the problem as well. I mean, like you've even got issues with things, say, for example, a few months ago, there were those issues with plastics. Now, plastics, you know, are manufactured in some cases in, in pellet form and they're sold by the ton, you know, in their, in their, in their sort of raw state before they're turned into, you know, a, a drink bottle or, or a uh, whatever, you know, or, or a child's toy, depending on, on what type of plastic you're talking about. But the problem was is that we reached a point uh, a few months ago whereby shipping costs were so high that it, that it just simply wasn't worth the, the manufacturers of, of these plastics in places, say, like India or Bangladesh, shipping them around the world because there wasn't, there wasn't any profit in it once you factored in the, the high cost of shipping. So it's really a, a super-duper a super duper complex thing, and all it takes is, as you say, one component missing, something completely innocuous, generally low cost, but once that component goes missing, the entire chain for that product can just grind to a halt. No, well, never mind. Of course, in Australia, we've got such a wonderfully broad and deep manufacturing sector that we make all our own stuff and sell it here locally anyway. So we're completely insulated from this, aren't we? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not like we, it's not like our, our construction sector has seen material costs rise up to 15% and that, you know, that this could potentially, you know, completely inflate the cost of new housing and you know not only that but they're from you know i mean i've had i've had mates who are tradies who've been sent home because there wasn't enough materials because of supply chain issues so you know there there are a lot of, of of concerning indicators there and the truth is that we don't know i mean things perhaps things will turn out for the better but by the same token perhaps they won't now this is a good uh chart from Oxford Economics that shows basically, you know, in a very, very broad sense that supply chain issues are actually getting worse, not getting better, that the stresses on supply chains are actually getting greater. And 
the thing is, if we do see continued issues with, with lockdowns in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in China, where there's been a rather large outbreak in the, in the port city of Dalian, um, we, we, we could see some rather significant problems. And if they go back into lockdown, you know, once again, it just, it just restarts the clock on all these supply chain issues. And we're going to be having the same conversation five, six, 12 months, potentially 12 months from now that, that these problems continue to persist. And as it stands from what I've read from experts who do have a bit of an inside line as to the, the priorities of the Chinese government, China's zero COVID policy is going to continue over winter and into next year. So if they can't get Delta under control and if they we do see continued lockdowns, you know, we these these supply chain driven inflation issues are going to continue and the Fed's narrative is going to be in tatters, well, greater tatters. Yeah, absolutely. And interesting among that, um, I was uh, reading today of, um, because of the COVID outbreak, that uh, some trains heading from one place to another place in China were stopped and everyone was bundled off and taken essentially to uh, supervised um, uh, facilities uh, while they were tested and um, you know put in isolation for <laughs> quite a few days. So suddenly they, their plans were rather changed and other people had gone on um, holidays to other parts of uh, China um, uh, through the golden week, um, couldn't get back because essentially they, <laughs> they were locked down. So they are taking um, zero tolerance really to its limits and uh, are really, you know, even now dialing down very hard to try and actually get back to a total zero. Very different, of course, from our strategy or indeed many other Western um, countries. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Indeed. I mean, we, we're just going to have to have to see what happens. And, you know, if we do see further lockdowns in Europe or in the, or in parts of the US, I mean, you know, then, then we once again have supply chain issues getting worse, you know, with contributing factors globally. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Yeah, and we might just, uh, you might have a slide on this, but the Evergrande thing on property in China, of course, continues to wobble. More defaults um, looking as though they're probably going to come through. And um, in the same um, week, of course, the, the Z basically got um, endorsed for um, his strategies um, into the future. Indeed. Now, this is, this is probably one of the most concerning charts in the world, probably the most concerning chart in the world, and it shows the... North American fertilizer price versus the cost of food globally. And basically fertilizer prices are just setting off for the moon. And food prices are generally expected to follow. And part of the problem in all of this is that a lot of farmers are now deciding that, you know, can I do more with less? Can, am I going to roll the dice on having less fertilizer on my crops, potentially accepting lower crop yields, but then having lower costs? And that's one of the really big, big problems in all of this. And to be honest, I mean, for, for Australians, we're quite lucky. We're a wealthy nation. You know, if there, is a, if there is a farmer in the Sudan who wants to sell their crops, they'd rather sell them to us for more money and we pay the higher cost at the supermarket. But for the locals, they're the ones who miss out. And that's one of the reasons why fertiliser prices and food prices are such a huge issue from a social, political, geopolitical perspective because they can undermine governments, and they have in the past. I mean, if you look at the, the peak of the UN food price index there, which peaked in early 2011, that coincides with the Arab Spring. And, and uh, food prices, in particular wheat prices, were a heavy contributing factor in, in, those, in, those, in that social unrest. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you make a very important point because for people in Western um, particularly advanced Western countries, you know, food as a total proportion of um, annual expenditure or monthly expenditure is pretty low. But if you look at it in some of developing countries, you know, the food costs are actually a huge proportion of total expenditure. So if food prices double, that's really serious. Uh, it absolutely is. And that's part, of the, that's part of the issue because if you do see food prices rise I mean, you know, we've we've seen them, you know, rise rise significantly. You know, in some cases, you know, forty or fifty percent on some items. You know, if we if we see those types of rises here, here, you know, here in Australia, you know, as you say, it's a much smaller percentage of our of our household budgets. But it's also the fact that in in Australia, we've got you know things like corporate overheads, you've got things like packaging, you've got all 
all these other aspects of the food supply chain, which are which you know add costs, but it also reduces the total proportion of the actual food product in you know as an input. But if you're talking about someone who's buying it from a from a market in the developing world, there the, the, there are much fewer inputs there to absorb that rising that rising cost, and it's a much much greater uh, increase when it when when it does occur. Yeah, and I would remind you in Australia, you know, a good proportion of households um, have less than one month's savings, so they've got very little buffers even here in Australia with, um, you know, cost of living rising and with inflation much higher than the uh, official numbers. So, you know, it doesn't take much to tip uh, more people into severe strife, even here in Australia, as you say. It's, uh, you know, different from overseas in some developed areas, but still even locally we could see some significant pressures too. Well, that's that's one of my one of my major issues with the the RBA and its its inflation is transitory. Don't worry about it. Narrative, just that the increase in food prices, the increase in rents that we've already seen. Now, I'm not talking about the ones that they that they, that they report in the CPI, but the ones that people are actually experiencing, you know, on 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 their day to day, is much much greater than than raising rates by 1.15 or 0.25 percent in in net terms on the on on the economy. Yet we persist in this idea that somehow raising rates is the end of the world and that taking rates even back to where they were prior, prior to COVID is like this just evil thing that only people who, who want to impose pain and misery on the entire populace would ever possibly consider doing while completely ignoring the fact that the vast majority of people don't have a mortgage. And even those that do are so little on it that that at the end of the day, even if rates rise by 1% or, or even 2%, a lot of them aren't going to have any ha have a problem because their mortgage originated when rates were at 4% or 5% or 7 or 10 But, you know, that, that's, that's not really part of the conversation for reasons that escape me. Well, of course, the other issue there, you've got the marginal borrower, the one who came in recently when rates were really low and were highly leveraged, and that's where a lot of the pain will be initially felt. Um, and once again, uh, all of the um, historic data, like from Hilda and places like that, aren't taking account of those recent changes. So we have a very, very weird, skewed story, right? And in fact, you could argue the policies are being um, targeted at those with high levels of debt. But as you say, not everybody's in the same boat. And if you're actually looking for any savings returns from deposits, then forget it, because basically term deposits are still way down. And interestingly, even NAB's results this year, uh, the, the, yeah, this year's results that came out this, this week, I think it was, or was it last week now, um, showed that uh, margin compression is still very, very strong. So the banks aren't necessarily actually benefiting. But, you know, the deposit rates are so low, low and um, rates are very, very low, and everybody grizzles when everybody talks about putting rates up at all. Exactly. And um, I mean, you know, ho ho hopefully we, we, we see some adults back in charge again, but I'm not, but I'm not really hopeful to be completely honest with you. <laughs> ah, well, you've got to remember, right? Remember, remember that the strategy is lend people more so that they can borrow bigger mortgages so that they can buy bigger properties so that they can see their house prices go up, which means there's the wealth effect. So people feel really more wealthy, so they're going to spend more, hence rising GDP. And uh, of course, there are more people with properties than those without properties. So effectively, from a political perspective, it's a winner. I mean, that's the, that's the real narrative that people don't necessarily want to come, to come to terms with, right? The political momentum and the economic momentum is keep prices high, keep lending more, never mind the risks. Well, I mean, I'd really like to add some commentary to that, but I think you summed it up pretty well, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the US CPI, which, as you can see, has basically gone, you know, to the moon in relative terms. You know, it's at, at, at its highest level since since the early 1990s. And one of the things I, that I will point out in this chart is when inflation hits this this level, when it, it rises so so swiftly, when it hits you know such a high to high level. You really do normally. You can you can see what happens. Normally, you get a recession, and that that's obviously caught you know well not caused but contributed to by by central banks raising rates. So, 
I mean, it really does make you think of what we just in a very, very fast forwarded version of a, of a normal cycle, whereby we will see the Fed or we will see central banks raising rates next year. And that will be the end of this cycle. No, and no different to the one that occurred in 2008 or even the one that occurred in, in the early 1990s. Well, there is definitely an argument, and I think there's some merit, and that we are ultimately going to see a deflationary um, story coming later, right? So the inflationary thing, they might put rates up. But economies are slowing in many countries around the world. And um, if people stop borrowing and effectively, you know, hanker down, then we could actually be into the deflationary element. So the interesting real philosophical question is, has the economic cycle suddenly been bust because of low interest rates and all quantitative easing or as you say is it just accelerated and are we going to see the old history playing out you know history may not um, repeat itself but it sure does rhyme well it, it, it may well it may well i mean i think i think one of the things that's important to keep in mind in all this is that around the world rates are already rising you know we we are the the exception in, in, in many ways here in the west you know the you know we you know we've got the rba saying oh, we're not going to raise rates until until 2024 but you know, then you've got the in in say in the US as of as of yesterday, three rate hikes are priced into futures and by the end of next year. And if you look into in, in other places, you know, Brazil, Ru Russia, the Czech Republic, Poland, you know, all throughout the world are, are raising interest rates. Even in places like like Korea, you know, rate rate you know rate hikes are coming, and you know, eventually. You know, you you, you have, you'd have to think that the the rate hikes will arrive, unless of course a slowing global economy arrives arrives first. Mm. Well, I actually have a theory that we'll see some rate rises, and then they'll have to reverse course again, right? Because effectively, the uh, dampening effect of those rate rises will be uh, quite significant. And I also make the point: RBA, of course, having turned off yield cu cu curve control, well, they they justified it because. It's time had come. The truth is, of course, the markets basically forced them to do it. Um, they don't really have many other shots in, in, the lotter, in the locker at the moment. And so they're basically trying to talk the markets away from expecting rate rises. But the interesting question is to what extent forward guidance really has teeth if the markets really get their, um, their you know, th th their thoughts uh, in a different space. And those fixed mortgage rates, you know, 50, 80 basis points higher than they were a little while ago, um, gives me a very strong sense that we're going to see rate rises higher in Australia than the RBA's um, current predictions. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I don't think that that, I mean, the, 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 the big issue in, in, in all of this for me is just is what happens with global asset prices. Because obviously, if we see a, a huge historic bust, as the likes of you know, a Jeremy Grantham or or, or John Hussman or people like that who who are calling you know for these things to, I mean you know there's, there's people talking about you know depression level crashes in asset prices, but I mean as we were discussing recently on on Twitter, I mean even if we see a you know 50 55 percent drop from where the S and P 500 is today, that only takes us back to you know, February, March, 2020. It's not, you know, I mean, it's going to be seen as the end of the world by Wall Street and by, you know, a lot of people who bought at the top, but purely in terms of just the the, the number, the underlying numbers, I mean, it's it, it shouldn't be the end of the world. But I mean, that's what happens when you when people just bet everything on on the Fed and on rising asset prices. Well, the markets are still banking on the Fed rescuing any pr prospective fall in the markets, right? But, you know, as I said in that Twitter conversation, the theory of a stock price is it should be the net present value of future cash flows, right, discounted to an appropriate rate. So if rates go up, then that does change it. But most of the stocks in the S&P 500 are way, way, way highly priced in the S&P 500 than their future earnings would suggest they should be. So we've actually got a complete disconnect at the moment between what I would say the true fair value of stocks is and what markets value of stocks are. And that is the difference created by the premium, which is the confidence in that the Fed will always pump if necessary, right? And that ultimately is what the markets are betting on. I, I think I think the part of the a really interesting part of that conversation is that as things evolve, that now includes the People's Bank of China and the Chinese Communist Party in that in that metric. Because 
you can't have a slowing China to the, to the degree that it, that it is currently, to the degree that it may occur if it allows its property sector to continue to undergo this controlled demolition. You, it, you know, in, unless, unless the, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government rescue the sector and bail it out in the same way that, that it has been before, you are going to see slower Chinese growth. You are eventually going to see some adjustment in Chinese property. And we're completely unprepared for that. We're completely unprepared for the, for the drop in commodity prices, for example, here in Australia. But we're also completely unprepared for that drop in, in Chinese household wealth, in, in, in weaker Chinese consumption, in the fact that, you know, say, for example, uh, one, of the, one of the most impacted companies in all that would be Germany. 47% of their GDP is exports and a, and a large share of those exports flow to, the, to, to, to China. So, you know, you, we live in this globalised world, yet too often I find Wall Street and analysts and all these other folks ignore what's going on in the rest of the world. I mean, the rest of the world is tightening monetary policy. They're, they're, they're trying to put their, their boot down on inflation to keep it low, which is obviously going to, over time, slow their economies and all this is occurring at a time when everyone thinks that the Fed is going to save markets and markets are going to continue to go to the moon. And maybe they will. Maybe they will for quite a lot longer than we expect. But in terms of the real global economy, things are, things are quite a bit more challenging. Mm. And, of course, the, the more it overshoots what I would call fair value, the greater the downward force is ultimately when it actually goes, um, you know, pear-shaped. And there's a thing called the megaphone trend, which is actually quite an interesting way of looking. So look at recent, uh, you know, lower levels and recent higher levels. And basically what you're doing is seeing where those movements are, right? And if you look at the megaphone pattern uh, in the US at the moment, then if markets were to go, the S&P 500 would be at least 55% lower than where yeah. it is now, right? 55%. But even then, as you say, it would still be at values that were still a few years ago regarded as, well, a bit stupid. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, it just, it, it kind of boggles my mind that, that, that indices more broadly are being valued based upon the cash flows and the, the revenues that they've seen over the, over the last, you know, 12 or 18 months. I mean, it's like, oh, but, you know, but revenues are up. It's like, well, of course they're up. You've just thrown a World War II size deficit at the economy almost entirely, you know, at, at consumers and businesses. Of course it's going to have, of course you're going to see rising earnings, you know, in a lot of these companies. And it's like, you know, how long is it going to take for them to be able to organically obtain those earnings again once those savings are spent? And the truth is we don't know. You know, we don't know what it's going to be like when we finally... Uh, tip back towards services spending instead of goods. And that's another point as well in terms of inflation is what will happen when we do start to see demand for services return? Are we going to see services inflation take off? Because right now, services inflation is very, very weak in the US. If we see that take off in the same way goods inflation has, even in, even to, the, to a fractional point, that could really begin to entrench in inflation in the US. And the latest ISM services index had uh, the, the prices paid by services-based companies just absolutely going to the moon. Yeah, and then, of course, the follow-on from that is wages growth, and then you've got that uh, spiral again beginning to start. goes back to that 1970s conversation we had earlier on because ultimately if you start seeing wages accelerate away, um, then that is going to be a feedback loop that then goes into the produ production of services and goods and those prices go higher and, the, you know, and it spirals up and spirals up. And I don't think a lot of people who've perhaps not been around for the last 20, 30 <laughs> years only, right, but, you know, they've only been around for uh, this sort of low inflation environment, they don't understand this horrible positive feedback loop that is actually the wages, prices, wages, prices spiral up. I mean, I, was, I lived through it and I, I was, you know, remarkably surprised how quickly it got out of hand last time. So um, it's worth watching. It is. And I think that there are other factors in the labour market that really need to be considered to a greater degree by the likes of the Fed and by policymakers more broadly. I mean, you know, we've seen a significant drop off in the participation rate in the US and it, it is having a very hard time recovering. And, you know, there are some theories to what degree they're true 
that that the vaccine mandates may may end up uh, prompting others who are who have the money to retire early. You know, particularly in 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 the trucking industry and and in logistics. And that's something that I think is really interesting because you've essentially moved, removed 3, 3.5 million workers from the American labour market, which means the labour market is inherently much, much tighter than it otherwise would be, which means there's going to be more upward pressure on wages than there otherwise would be. So you could you could see, you know, inflation to, occurring to a much greater degree much, much sooner than, I'm sorry, wage inflation occurring much, much sooner than a lot of people expect. Yeah, well, that's uh, my bet. And interestingly, in Australia, of course, there are a few industries where wages inflation is quite strong, so it's in the IT sector, right? But if you look at um, uh, you know, human care, health care, those sort of areas, wages growth is pretty low. And of course, in the public sector, they've still got um, a very slow or freezes in place. So it'll be interesting to see whether anything happens there before the uh, next election. My feeling is that <laughs> the government will sit on public wages until after the election. Uh, and then basically whoever gets in next time will suddenly find they've got this big wages problem. Well, it's, it's going to be very interesting because to give this, to give this a little bit of a historical context, uh, in, in 2007, during the election campaign, the RBA raised rates for the first time ever during an election campaign. And that Arguably, arguably played a role in why John Howard and the Liberal Party got, well, lost the 2007 election so badly. Howard was actually forced to go on live television and apologise to borrowers, which is rather ironic if you consider that rates were 6.5% at the time and a 0.25% rate was rate rise wasn't that big of a deal. But, you know, here in the here and now, if you see a 0.25% rate rise it's going to be a much, much greater blow to household budgets and potentially a bit, bit of a problem for, for Scott Morrison if it does occur before the election. And on, on that particular note, just a few weeks, just a few weeks ago, the, uh, the Aussie rate futures were predicting just that. Absolutely. Yeah, it will be very interesting. And, um, you know, they'll find a way of spinning it because, of course, the uh, current incumbents uh, are spin masters except that sometimes the spin cycle doesn't actually get you to where you expect. No, it, it doesn't. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why they're struggling in the polls at the moment. Yeah. But I think we should probably move on to the next slide because <laughs> I think we've probably got sidetracked for long enough. Go on. <laughs> okay, this is that chart of Chinese producer prices, highest level in 26 years. And this is part of what we were discussing previously, because if you do start to see consumer prices rising in China, if you do start to see these uh, these inputs feed in, these, these price inputs feed into the to global supply chains, we're going to have some rather significant problems. I mean, we've already seen uh, chip manufacturers raise their prices between 5 and 15%. We've even seen people who, uh, we've even seen Chinese tyre manufacturers, for example, raise their prices by more, by 10% or more, which is, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, when when I when I was younger and I needed cheap tires for my car, they were cheap Chinese tires. And you know, if they're going to get ten percent more expensive, that's something that's going to feed into problems even here in Australia. And if that feeds into a broader uh, inflationary push across industry, then we're, we're going to have an unprecedented problem of China of China exporting inflation instead of effectively exporting deflation. Yes, and that feedback loop, I think, is really, really important for people to understand, right? Because essentially it really changes the economic flows internationally. It, it does. And, it, I mean, you know, that, that really is the, the nightmare scenario that I imagine keeps people like Philip Lowe and Jerome Powell awake at night. Because, you know, as, as a huge importer of goods here in Australia, you know, if, if we start to see, you know, that type of inflation feed into, in, into our import bottom line, we're going to have some fairly serious inflationary pressures to deal with, even, even if they do manage to suppress wage growth with, you know, in, with, with, with immigration and, and with all that, all, all those other policies. And, that's, and that's, uh, that, I think, is a, a key part of the discussion surrounding the RBA, surrounding interest rates. Now, I, I personally don't think that they're going to be able to hold off raising rates if we do start to see this feedback loop of rising import costs, because... At the end of the day, Aussie Aussie wage increases are so sorry. Aussie wage data is so lagged, and wage growth tends to be a lagging indicator more broadly. That 
we, we could see some fairly significant problems occurring in terms of inflation if this particular scenario does come to pass long before the RBA wants to raise rates, but they but they may not have a choice. The market, the market may put funding pressures on the banks and the RBA may be dragged kicking and screaming. Well, of course, the RBA is so accurate in terms of its forward <laughs> projections that we'll have complete confidence in their ability to be able to pick the timing of rate rises. That was a joke, folks. <laughs> Really, did, 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 I thought all, all of their wage growth forecasts come true. Perhaps you should whack that up on the screen, Martin. <laughs> there is a chart, isn't there? I'll try and look it out, which shows that the uh, expectation, 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 reality, 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 right? Um, it is pretty, uh, pretty shocking. Like I said the other time when we were chatting, Tarek, if I was paid on results of the RBA, I'd be worried. <laughs> Well, to be fair, I suppose you would do, you would conduct monetary policy very differently than they would. <laughs> That's probably fair too. <laughs> okay. Now, this is this one I really like. It basically just shows just the absurd level of disconnect that we're seeing between the US federal funds rate, which is basically their cash rate, and the CPI. And <laughs> it just it just makes a mockery of monetary policy, in my opinion, to be completely frank with you. You know, I mean, it's it's deeply negative, it's ridiculous. And even if you look back as far as like the 1980s when inflation was heading for the absolute moon, you never saw it this 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 negative. And it's just it's just absurd. I think I think that we just need we, I think we just need a clean out of monetary policy and just a reset because it's not working. Well, I agree with that. Um, monetary policy has been, um, frankly, mishandled uh, for a long, long time. Um, the results have not actually played through as people expected. They've just done more and more of the same. Basically, you know, if this doesn't work, well, we'll double it and we'll double it. And of course, the other point is you have to have a, a logarithmic in Increase of quantitative easing to get any impact, right? And like I said at the start, if you think about all that money that's been thrown into this around the world, what do we got for it? No, two and sixpence. So time for a different review, a different sort of way of thinking. And frankly, there should be a review of the Reserve Bank and its role and mandate and its efficacy, because I actually think this fundamentally questions, to my mind, what is a central bank for? Who is it really serving? And um, how do you measure its success? Because at the moment, I think on all those three, I would say it's not doing its job. Indeed, and I'd, I'd personally like to see monetary policy be assessed within the context that it's meant to be assessed. I mean, the idea is you cut interest rates, businesses invest, businesses create jobs, businesses drive in inflation to within the target band. That's generally what's meant to happen. That hasn't happened for almost a decade. We haven't seen rate, rate decreases spur business investment. In, in fact, business investment has continued to collapse pretty much year after year for almost a decade now here in Australia. And if it's not achieving the goals that it's meant to achieve, then why keep doing it? And, you know, shouldn't, you know, instead, all we've done is, is hollow out households reliant on fixed income, make more retirees, reliant on the age pension made more people pay higher taxes for these retirees who are now reliant on the age pension and create bigger deficits. And it's just ridiculous. But, in, but there's absolutely no real discussion of these factors. I mean, I think that we should have interest rates at a level where a self-funded retiree who has too much assets for the Centrelink uh, pension test should be able to comfortably support themselves on relatively risk-free assets. Because that's what is meant to happen. That's that's literally the mandate. But you know, we just pretend that it's not a problem, and all the you know these retirees either take bigger risks, or the the capital dwindles and they end up reliant on the taxpayer. And I'm not saying that they don't they're not entitled to that. They absolutely are. But but we should have a system that doesn't make them reliant on that in the first place, so they can stand on there entirely on their own two feet. Yeah. Well, we've come so far from. Yeah, a balanced policy and a sensible policy. And it's partly because of the politicisation of the Reserve Bank and it's partly because of the fact that the fixation on property prices and asset price acceleration um, it has basically been the key focus because, you know, that does feed into GDP, but unfortunately it doesn't work. The economy is not a better in better shape because of it. And there is no accountability either within government nor indeed in the RBA itself for any of those policy mistakes, which I would argue have been in 
in place probably for the best part of 30 years, not just 10 years, but the last 10 years absolutely accelerated. And yet the mainstream political class and the mainstream um, you know, media um, don't want to mention this, don't mention it, you know, don't mention the war. Well, I will say I must. I will say that, that that there have been a couple of articles recently that have been that have covered this really, really quite well. That that the that these issues are becoming entrenched. That they that they are deep, deep seated social problems that are creating, you know, this this underclass. This uh, you know, just not just from an economic perspective, but from a social one. There was there was a, a parliamentary Senate committee. That, that did a report into housing prices and housing affordability back in 2007. And it's, it's actually quite interesting reading because it, it, it came to the conclusion that, ha- that, um, that home ownership was key to, 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 to community, to society, to people, to people participating in their local communities, to engaging, to giving people a sense of belonging. It, 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 has, it has a positive, uh, it has a, it, positively contributes to, to um, community engagement. It positively contributes to better outcomes for people, uh, for, for, their, for their children, for just everything more broadly. Everything that you can possibly imagine is, well, maybe not everything, but most things, the most quantifiable things are better when you have a higher rate of home ownership because it gives people a sense of belonging and a stake in the system. While instead, we've ended up with this thing now where basically you have a generation of people or a sizable portion of a generation who just want to burn the thing down, watch it burn and just go, oh, oh, well, I wasn't going to get anywhere anyway. I've still got to do my crappy job and I'm still not going to be able to afford things, but at least the rest of you you people have to suffer along with me now. And that's not a positive thing for a society. No, and as we've said before, of course, with all this focus on property and investment in property and all of the lending to property, it sucks out the economic air more broadly. It means we're not investing in the things we should be investing in. People have a ever greater fixation on property. It becomes effectively all in- encompassing. And I-, I may have mentioned this before, but um, Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy guy, wrote a wonderful piece called, um, in-, in one of the sort of sections, called The Shoe Event Horizon. And basically, um, it, what, you know, the story goes like this briefly. You can actually look in a lot of planets around the solar system, right, and they all have a shoe event horizon because basically more and more of the high street ultimately gets uh, turned into shoe shops, right? And ultimately everything is just shoe shops, and then the society collapses, and then uh, you know, millions of years later they'll find this sort of laminar layer of, of leather and nothing else because effectively the total fixation on just one thing. Well, it may not be a shoe event horizon, but I think it's a property event horizon that we're actually facing at the moment. And unfortunately so. And I think it should be added in all of this that the RBA knows that, that this is hollowing out the economy. Their own research has, has shown that. They, it has shown that higher levels of household debt basically mean people spend less on other things. And, I mean, it may sound obvious to you and, and to everybody else who, who's paying attention, and I mean, you as a viewer, not just not just Martin. I know it's fairly obvious to him as well. But and that then the Bank of International Settlements has come to the same thing, and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has come to the same conclusion. Yet instead of going, oh crap, we're we're hollowing out the economy, we're limiting economic growth, we're limiting opportunities, we're increasing inequality, they just keep doing it anyway, regardless of what their own research and what their own findings actually say. Well, that's why I think it comes back to a politicization of the RBA, right? I don't believe they're objective independent. I believe that they're actually part of the um, political and social process that's actually got a particular doctrine about it, you know. Um, that's the problem. Um, I don't think it's being objective. It's not being independent. It's not actually doing the right thing for the broader Australians. But, of course, the property sector is um, booming and uh, house prices are going up, so everyone's happy. No, 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 no. We need a different set of realities here. And... Uh, you know, at some point, this is going to come unglued and people are going to have to wake up. But unfortunately, that headache is going to be a big, long hangover. Well, I'm not going to say unfortunately, but indeed. Now, this is, this is the last one for the, for the week. And it basically just shows that the, the cost of Chinese USD junk bonds has basically headed to the absolute moon. And I actually think that there's been another chart released today since this one was posted, which basically shows that the uh, yields on Chinese junk bonds, which is basically their, their annual borrowing costs, are up to about 25%. And that is just an insane number. And 
that's one of the really, really big issues that the Chinese property developers are facing at the moment because the property developers who are borrowing for new projects or the ones who are rolling over debts are now turning around and going, crap. Prior to this, you know, maybe I had a five-year bond in 2016, 2017, and I was paying seven, six or seven percent. And now I want to refinance that and I'm paying 25%, provided anyone will actually lend to me. So that's how this could really get quite ugly. And part of the problem in all this as well is how much of this debt is off balance sheet? How much is owed into this shadow banking sector that's murky, that's that's dark, and that we don't really understand that well. And I mean, even Evergrande alone has about $155 billion in off-balance sheet debts, according to a Goldman Sachs analysis, which I believe is probably more debt than, than 75% of countries have it in, the, in, in most of the world. Yeah, I remember talking to Harry Dent some time ago, uh, he who always said, when the world economy wobbles, it's going to be China that's going to trigger it. Right? And he actually said, you know, look at the amount of leverage in China, look at the amount of property exposure. I think he's um, still proving necess- perhaps to be right, or might take a bit of time. But I'd make the other point also, Tarek, that the transparency as to what's really going on with regard to the property sector in China and the amount of debt is also very, very low. So we don't really know the full story. We only know bits of the story so far. We do know that, um, you know, some bonds got paid, some didn't, some may, some may not. We're not sure the source of funds. But if you look at it as the proportion of the total Chinese economy that's connected to this and those prices, you know, the junk bond prices in particular, I always chuckle when I think of junk bonds in China, by the way, um, it sort of makes the point that um, um, this has got not just local Chinese um, echoes to it, but it has global economic echoes to it. And frankly, Australia is right in the crosshairs in this. Well, we've been, we've actually been relatively lucky so far because, I mean, you know, Chinese steel production has absolutely plummeted. You know, we've seen, you know, steel production undergo its its largest ever drop by an enormous margin. You know, they're simply just not making that, you know, the same amount of steel as they were. Yet iron ore prices are still sitting around roughly where they were through, through throughout most of last year. Well, the, the latter half of last year after the initial uh, impact of COVID. But, you know, and it's a, it's a similar thing with coking coal. Coking coal is actually performing very, very well, relatively speaking, because it's a cheaper alternative to, um, not a cheap alternative, a better alternative when you don't have enough electricity to run an arc furnace uh, that you can, that you use coking coal instead. So, you know, we've been quite lucky so far, but the question is, is what's going to happen when that, when the, the Olympics are over, the, the pollution mandates are, you know, shifted higher again and they, you know, the people can go back to normal levels of production. What is a normal level of production going to look like? And if, and if it is going to be significantly lower more permanently, what is that going to look like for the iron ore price, the coking coal price, the thermal coal price, and, what, and, and how much damage is that going to do to the bottom line for Australia? Yeah, and um, it's probably a good place to draw the show to a close, Tarek, insofar that uh, we know that there are lots of things out there that are looking pretty ugly at the moment, right? But uh, hopefully people will have uh, enjoyed um, at least exploring some of them with us. Um, you know, we're going to have to come back and uh, talk a bit more in another show about some of the consequences, I think, because, you know, there are so many warning signs. And I guess, you know, I don't know what you think, but to my mind, the real message from this conversation is don't necessarily believe everything you read in the mainstream, don't necessarily believe what the markets are telling you, because they're only telling you a, a very small proportion relative to the total picture. Well, I think in yesterday in particular really showed that not even the market has a handle on all this. I mean, we, sh- we saw you know Chinese property companies go to the moon on this announcement that the Chinese government was pulling back on, on some of these restrictions around, around borrowing around the property developers. And then later that night, once the market closed, we found out that that wasn't even true. <laughs> so you just, you, you just, at this point, you just, you just don't know, you know, there's, there's just so much uncertainty and, you know, just so many, so many rumors and, and, and lies and half and half truths going around, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I think that the message is make sure that we don't um, get too caught up with a particular uh, a line of doctrine at the moment because a <laughs> A lot of these lines of doctrine are a bit uh, a bit shonky, right? And uh, the biggest for me is this. 
It's simply the idea that uh, somehow central banks are going to save us. Um, sorry, but I don't believe it. No, every, it, nothing lasts forever. You know, it can last a lot longer than than, than a lot of uh, more bearish people think, but nothing, nothing goes one way forever. Yeah, Tarek, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciated speaking with you. And uh, we'll do it all again another time. Take care. Yeah, no worries, mate. You, you have a good one. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.